Welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. Uh, this is Lucas Stuber, joined as usual by my friend Rachel Madel. How are you? Hi, Lucas. I'm good. How are you? I'm good, as usual. Um, I'm, I'm always a little chipper, I think. So um, I'm really excited mm-hmm. about our episode this week. So we had an opportunity to talk to Pearson um, about their electronic assessment program called Q Interactive. Um, and I think it's going to be really intriguing for a lot of people. But one thing it made me think about, and you even told me a story about how yesterday you were doing a new assessment for AAC, right? And um, how, how challenging that was. Yeah, you know, I've been finding in my practice, I'm getting a lot of um, referrals with kids who already have an AAC assessment, and it's just not valid. Um, yesterday, I was working with a little girl, and the recommendation was a field size of four. Um, so going into the you know, assessment, I was thinking, okay, like, this is like pretty severe, you know, access issues if it's only, you know, a field size of four. By the end of the session, um, you know, we had her at a a field size of 60. Um, And, you know, I was kind of trying to rack my brain. Why? Why is this going on? Why would they say field size of four? And then after the fact, I talked, you know, to the mom and, you know, it, it turned out that they weren't using anything motivating. And of course, like, that's my number one thing, like, okay, you know, we need to capitalize on whatever in that moment is motivating a child. So, you know, she was interested in listening to music on an iPhone. And so that's what we did. We used an iPhone and, you know, I was moving the the iPhone all around. I was trying to, you know, hide it in a, you know, amongst a bunch of core words and, you know, literally a hundred percent, she got it every time. That's great. Yeah. I think it's just a testament to, you know, we have to find things that are motivating. Right. Great. That's well. And when you say field size of four, you mean four communication options as opposed to, right. you know, 60. Right. And, you know, when I say 60, you know, obviously I wasn't going to start her off with a vocabulary, you know, of 60 words, but, you know, just to support the motor planning, I like to see, you know, I want to get the largest grid size that I can. So there's room for growth and development for vocabulary. Right. Um, right. And I was just, I was blown away. Yep. With, you know, and I think it also goes back to, you know, we just have to presume that these kids are capable of doing amazing things. Um, that's where we have to start. Right. That's great. Well, and I, I can totally relate. I had worked with a student for, for a while that um, he did the cutest thing. It was great. So, you know, when, when we originally uh, built the system for him, you know, or the system rather that I inherited from folks that, you know, had <laughs> built it was, uh, was really limited in its scope of communication. You know, it was not robust is the word that we use in terms of giving a student all the communication options that we can. But when we started to introduce things that, you know, were specific to his interests, like the, the, the great one was that he always wanted to, to ask to say a prayer. And the, the, what that sort of meant for him is that he wanted his father to hold him and hug him because that's what they did when they, when they said a prayer. But when, once, it was great. This kid is adorable. I love him. But um, once we had that in the system, you know, even within a, an enormous field of options, he was, willing, he was able to, to navigate and find that choice. And, um, you know, this was a student that did not have uh, issues with, um, you know, with motor plans or anything like that. It's a little bit controversial, actually, for me to even say this, but one of the things that I did in assessment was move that choice around, right? So that Mm -hmm. he was attending to the device rather than, you know, executing a motor plan. Um, I think there's uh, people in the industry have mixed feelings about that, but. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I think in an assessment situation, that's important, right? You know, we want to make sure that, you know, at some level, we want to see how a child is scanning, you know, a vocabulary. Um, You know, we don't, that's not where we stay, right? We don't stay with, you know, always expecting a child to scan through vocabulary. Eventually, they learn the motor plans for where their vocabulary is, and that's what they rely on. Um, But I think in an assessment uh, situation, it's, it's totally you know, um, it should be expected to just kind of see where they're at. I I, I agree. And, and, you know, if you have uh, other feelings, please do contact us, uh, tech at speechscience.org or go to tech.speechscience.org. And we have a nice new flashing button there that says, well, it's not actually flashing, but uh, a button that uh, that allows you to (laughs) submit comments and questions. Um, Because I'd love to hear how you feel about that. But I I do definitely agree that's something I would do in assessment, not necessarily, um, you know, later down the road. But when we think about assessment in AAC, there's a lot of considerations, right? I mean, it's, it's complex. It can be more than, um, than a language assessment generally. So we have to think about, we have to think about where the, the student's at in terms of language, right? We have to think about, um, obviously, the, the need to presume competence and, and make a robust system that they can use. But also, we've got vision, and we've got motor access, and we have all these other things. Um, what's out there? Like in your practice, what do you use? 
I'm a big fan of the communication matrix, actually. Um, I think it does a really good job of setting the foundation. So those foundational communication skills, um, it just, it goes into uh, excruciating detail, which I really appreciate actually, because it makes you, uh, you know, it makes you look at communication acts um, in a very detailed, a strategic way. Um, you know, right. I'm constantly telling parents and teachers, kids are communicating in one way or the other. You know, it might not be talking or it might not even be selecting an icon or a button, but, you know, communication comes out in various degrees. And I think as SLPs, we have to be very cognizant and um, we have to have a lot of attention to detail to those things that we might not consider uh, traditional communication. Right. When you're just doing a, you know, a, I don't know, a language assessment or an articulation assessment, which I don't mean to imply that those things are simple, right? I mean, there's um, a lot of considerations there as well. But, you know, with, with AAC, we got to think about a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I fully agree about the communication matrix. I mean, I think one challenge for folks in the schools is that it is long, right? You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot mm -hmm. to do in given time. You know, and then another yes. thing that I've been asked um, a lot by SLPs is, is there one that just spits out the right solution, right? <laughs> they can like identify <laughs> like this is, this is the brand or yeah. this is the app. And, you know, I really don't think that would ever be possible. Go Absolutely. Ahead. And the reality is there's a lot of really great apps out there that all are robust and kind of fit the criterion for what I would, you know, expect out of a, you know, a robust AAC system. Um, so I think it just, those nuances just come down to individual differences, preferences. Um, something that I'm always kind of taking into consideration is, you know, is there a specific app that a family or a, a school knows really well? Um, you know, because I think one of the hardest challenging, hardest challenges in AAC is getting, you know, the whole team to adopt the system and to model on it. Right. Um, so if a, a family is, you know, very interested in LAMP, for example, um, and, you know, they feel like they know that system, um, that's a huge consideration for me when I'm recommending something right. because, you know, we need to have that carryover. Um, and yep. I know some, some people in the AAC world are, you know, kind of upset with me maybe right now, um, but it's just, it is a huge consideration. You know, obviously we have to balance what is right for a specific child, but also we have to balance, you know, what a team will adopt and use because the reality is if a team doesn't use it, it's, it's null and void in a right. lot of ways. Yeah, that's, that's a great quote from Kate Ahern, who also recently spoke with us, um, that, you know, the way she put it, her metaphor was, it doesn't matter what church you go to as long as you all go together. Right. So it's more important for the whole team to be on board necessarily than, you know, it is to have, uh, you know, the perfect system. That said, it, to me, clinically, it's easy to identify maybe things that I'm not happy with relative, rather than things that I am happy with. If that makes sense. You know, I mean, there is, you know, there's a large portfolio of robust devices, but there's also um, some stuff that frankly is a little bit predatory out there in the app stores. And so that's mm -hmm. you know, one, of, one of our roles and one of our burdens as SLPs is to make sure that we educate ourselves about those. Um, you know, yeah. and, and give good advice. But um, anyway, I this is it's a big conversation, right? Assessment and AC. It's something that I'm sure we'll return to over and over again. But um, you know, in in this episode, uh, I'm I am once again very excited to feature Pearson. And uh, I, you know, we had really a fantastic conversation of not only about Q Interactive, but also of the role of tablets in schools, um, and then some things that are coming up for you know big assessments that we use like the Self and the Golden Cristo. So stick around after the break, uh, our conversation with Pearson. So we know that the end of the year is coming up for everyone, which means that it's that time where you should be maybe worrying a little bit about continuing education credits. So we've been thinking about that ourselves and we actually were able to line up a pretty great deal with MedBridge. So rather than $425 for a year for their premium subscription, we were actually able to line up $95 a year. So it's a $300 discount, which is like amazing, right? So if you go to medbridgeeducation.com, you can put in the promo code talking with tech and tech is all uppercase. I'm actually not sure if that matters, but tech's all uppercase. Again, promo code talking with tech and that'll get you the $95 price, which includes a lot of pretty awesome stuff. Like if you're listening to us because you're into AAC, there's a great presentation by John McCarthy out of Ohio University. 
um, a whole big series about pediatric intervention. I know, Rachel, you found one too. Yeah, I'm really excited. There's one by Laura DeThorne. She's out of the University of Illinois. It's called Eyes on the Prize, Communicative Competence in Children. Um, so I'm just always kind of a big believer in supporting the presumption of competence. So I think that that could be a really good one for That's our great. Well, and there's 365 total SLP courses, so there's a ton there. There's also a lot of stuff that you might encounter with your practice uh, along with AAC, like dysphagia, um, other things. There's some great education. The other thing that's really neat is that because it's the $425 subscription that we're getting for $95, you have access to their whole pinch patient education library, which has a whole bunch of uh, materials that you hand out to families that you work with. So we're really excited about this. So go to medbridgeeducation.com, use the promo code TALKINGWITHTECH, and you'll get this uh, really amazing discount. Well, welcome back to Talking With Tech. This is Lucas Stuber, joined as usual by my colleague, Rachel Madel. How are you? I'm fantastic. Fantastic. And then we also have Dustin Wallstrom, James Hankey, and Kristen Getz all with us from Pearson. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, we're very excited to, to have you here today and to talk about Q Interactive. Um, you know, this has uh, obviously been something that's really been a big change and a big step forward for, for assessment um, in our field. But um, just to start off, I'd, I'd love to, uh, you know, just go around the horn and um, hear what everyone does and maybe a bit about the history of Q Interactive. Sure. Uh, well, so I'm James Hankey, and uh, I've been with uh, Pearson and Q Interactive for about five years. And uh, I, I came to this business uh, from, the, uh, from the classroom. I used to be an elementary school teacher for a little bit. And uh, I actually also lived in Japan for about three years, uh, where I actually got, got married. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. I'm Dustin Wallstrom. I'm the um, product owner for Q Interactive. I uh, came to Pearson straight out of graduate school. So I'm actually a clinical psychologist by training. Um, got my PhD at the University of Minnesota, then came to Pearson and started as a research director on the uh, Wexler team, so working on the WISC and the WIPSI, and then in probably 2011 moved over to uh, Q Interactive as the research director and then ultimately became the, the product owner, which is a misleading term. I don't own anything, unfortunately, for me. Um, <laughs> the person who sort of sets priorities for the um, software development. And I'm Kristen Getz. I am a speech language pathologist. I practiced in the schools for about 13 years prior to joining Pearson. And I work right now as the research director for Q Interactive. But prior to that, I was on the speech and language content team. Great. That's, I was actually going to, I think it's really cool to hear that all of you have education backgrounds, right? I mean, that's not always the case with, with folks that are doing things. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, I, I'd love to hear just a little bit about the product for our listeners too, maybe if they're not familiar with it. Sure. So Q Interactive is, is basically about, um, it's about iPads. So uh, Q Interactive is an app that you just get from the app store, download it onto two iPads, where one would be in your hands as the practitioner, and the other would be in the hands of, of the client, the person you're testing. Uh, basically, the way that it works is uh, on, the, on the client-facing iPad, that's where the pictures or the stimuli would be displaying that the person would be responding off of. And so some of the nice features of the system are like instant scoring, instant results. Uh, as soon as you swipe off the last item um, when giving a test, you're able to produce a comprehensive score report, um, which can be a real time saver. I mean, one of the big pain points that, that I've heard from uh, SLPs in the past is it's not so much giving the test, but it's actually uh, crafting the report that is just a real time drain. And they just really kind of want to get, you know, move on past that and, and actually into delivering services. And so I, I think that we're really able to, to scratch that itch um, really, really well in terms of the, the instant reporting piece. Yeah, that's great. We actually were, we were just talking about this right before y'all came on. And I know one thing that I was joking about, but I'm, I'm serious with it, is that I am really bad at chronological age. <laughs> I always have to go on a website and type everything in. So it's, that's really useful. Um, wow. What have you, what has the reception been like? I mean, um, you know, obviously one thing that we talk about a lot is, uh, you know, I, I guess barriers to entry in terms of technology. Um, and I have had people give me feedback that they prefer paper protocols in these things. But I mean, 
the system's been around for five years. You've obviously got a lot of users. Um, how's that been? Yeah, so I think overall the um, the reception has been um, it's been really good. So like you said, we've been around for five years. Um, we've grown quite a bit every single year since we uh, initially launched. Uh, at when when we first launched Q Interactive, none of the sort of speech language tests were even a part of it. Um, so we started off with a very limited offering. It was basically the whisk and the waste and a, and a couple of other things. And then we sort of expanded from there, adding tests um, every single year. And so I think we first launched the self and the GFTA2 and the PPBT4 in 2012. Um, and so we've been kind of growing the, the speech market ever since. I think, I think what you hear from people in general is um, – some initial fear about making the switch over to doing this in a different way. Um, but then once they get going and they sort of get it figured out in general, the response is I, I can't ever go back. <laughs> and I feel the same way when we, when we were first doing some of our early testing, I remember we were doing retest studies and I would go from paper, digital, paper, digital. I'd see, you know, do something like four testings in a day. Um, and the last day when I had to give the paper protocols, I just thought to myself like, Oh, <laughs> you have to be kidding me. I don't want to do this again. Um, and, and I think that's the, that's the experience in general, but I think there's a sort of hump that you have to get over in the beginning um, to, to just sort of get experience with the system. I actually have a question. So my first experience with Q Interactive was I was doing an assessment, an outside assessment, um, you know, for a company and they sent me the login and I did actually the paper protocol, but then I was able to score it through Q Interactive. And I was like, what is this all about? I just had to input the, you know, the raw scores in and like, lo and behold, you know, out generated the score. I didn't have to like, you know, page the scoring manual and then also the report. So I feel like that could be a good way for clinicians who feel a little intimidated. Um, just kind of, you know, get your feet wet a little bit with the, the scoring capabilities. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point because I think what we hear from, I think what we hear from people is, so you spend all this time getting trained, right? So you spend an entire semester or a year, whatever it is in graduate school, just learning sort of the mechanics of how to give individualized clinical tests. Um, and depending on how long you've been in the profession, you've sort of built up all sorts of shortcuts and comfort and motor memory sort of related to how to do that. And so, you know, when you make the switch over to something like Q Interactive, it feels clunky at first because you don't have any of that experience. Um, and so I think, and, and what we hear from people is where they have sort of the most comfort is just the item content itself because they actually know the tests. Mm -hmm. and so, and so I think you're right. Just, sort of doing something that they're familiar with in terms of simply entering the scores and not having the pressure of someone sitting in front of them where they have to actually administer the tests at the same time is a way to sort of overcome because that's what people are most afraid of. I'm going to, I'm going to, something's going to happen and little Susie's going to be sitting in front of me and I'm going to look like I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Or I'm going to, um, something's going to go wrong with technology and I can't troubleshoot it and I'll lose all of my data. So if you just enter the scores after, that sort of yeah. gets you over those two fears. Well, exactly. It kind of puts you back, like you feel like you're in grad school. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like giving an assessment for the first time. You know, I've given the goal for the first though a million times, but, you know, doing it in a different capacity, um, it's scary. Yeah, and we always recommend that people... Um, I don't know, practice it, what, three to five times, James, to really start to feel comfortable with it. And, and when we say that, we mean actually give a test three to five times. Right. I think sometimes interpret that as I'll swipe through it three to five times. You're right. Um, and it's not really the same thing. One of the, one of the things that we did when we were uh, developing this, too, is we, we applied really a, a consistent design aesthetic when we came to how we built each sort of item card in a sense so that you know as you're becoming familiar with say one of the subtests within the self you are becoming familiar with other ones even if you haven't seen them yet so what that kind of results in is yeah there's some initial sort of fear and anxiety when you're having you say your first 20 30 minutes with with the system but um, very quickly you'll be like oh okay yeah so there's our timer over here and here are my point buttons and here are the different sort of resources that are on screen. So I think people are able to, to 
pick it up and, and, and really run with it faster than maybe what they originally felt or what, what they would have initially estimated. And another thing, so I, uh, I supervise um, grad students sometimes in CFYs, and they're always, you know, really nervous for the assessment. And I always tell them, listen, these are kids. They look at you as the expert. They have no idea that you're fumbling or you don't know what to say or, you know, it's just like it's not even on their radar. So I think that's another thing to remember is that, like, no one's judging you. This, you know, the seven-year-old that you're sitting in front of is not judging you for how you're, you know, administering an assessment. I don't know. I feel judged sometimes, but I think, <laughs> yeah, I think probably for like my clothing choices. Rather than <laughs> exactly. Um, do you, from maybe from a research standpoint or um, have you found that there's any difference in outcomes between the different versions of the tests? We've done very thorough research as far as equivalency, looking at the effect size between the subtests. So we have different research designs that we've incorporated and we looked at subtests on the self that Perhaps introducing a different medium might cause the examiner or the examinee to have a different behavior. And basically our standard is 0.2 or, or better, and uh, that's what we found on all of our subtests so far. Now we've done equivalency studies in the past where we have seen differences, and it's just our policy that we go back and investigate it, really get to the bottom of what, you know, what the problem is, see if there's something that we can change on the interface or, um, or anything that we need to look into further. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to know that on Q Interactive, none of the tests have actually been renormed digitally, um, at least ones that existed prior to Q Interactive, so things like the self. And so rather than renorming them, the goal was really to build them digitally in such a way where um, the constructs that got measured are identical across paper and digital, and then the raw scores that get yielded from both forms are interchangeable. And so that's sort of, you know, rather than the norming, we do the equivalent studies that that Kristen's talking about. And I think um, it's, it's not really just the studies. It's not like we go and develop the self and then do a study and hope that they come out equivalent. <laughs> yeah. Thoughtful in the entire development process about making sure the ways in which the tests are developed aren't gonna change constructs, either on the um, part of the examinee, so we don't wanna change anything about the examinee experience, or the part of the clinician. And, you know, if we change how clinicians read instructions or are able to record responses, all of those things could impact the final score. So we've been very thorough about not wanting to really change any of those um, test demands. And that's why you'll see on the self, we still require you to use paper for certain tests when you're you know, writing a sure. response or something like that, or the examinee is writing a response. And that's because you know, we know that moving those things to an iPad could potentially change the, the test demands and, and result in non-equivalence. Right. One of the things that we were recently really interested in and investigating was on the GFTA because the whole paper transcription and then moving that to a digital format, we really wanted to see what kind of differences we were going to see between uh, the examiners giving it on paper and digitally. And what we ended up seeing was, you know, a, a slight improvement in the way that people were capturing wow. those results because just the way the user interface is, uh, it just minimized examiner error. Wow. Um, so I have a question. So, you know, say I get my feet wet and then I'm like, yeah, I'm all about this, you know, Q interactive, um, but I'm working for a school district. How, what would I say to convince, you know, my administrators that Q interactive is, is the way to go? I think it depends on the administrator. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I think, I think, I think there's a couple of things that, that are, especially for people working in, in schools um, be, and, and kids. So one is, I, I think there's all this stuff around efficiency mm -hmm. and mobility. So, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily find that Q Interactive reduces the testing time itself all that much, though I think it, I think it does, especially maybe on some tests like the GFTA. Um, but we do find that there's a huge cost savings after the fact by virtue of not having to do any hand scoring and being able to generate your reports automatically. And so, you know, there's, so there's cost savings there. And I, I don't think it necessarily means like, well, you need fewer employees or anything like that, but that people can spend their time doing other things that improve student outcomes. Um, you can spend more time intervening, um, you know, doing things like that rather than scoring protocols. Um, there's, 
definitely a mobility factor. So you don't need kits for a GFTA and a self and whatever else and carry all that stuff around. I don't know if SLPs do this, but when we met with school psychologists early on, you know, we would see people who had the trunks of their cars configured to look like closets. So oh, they- yeah. 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 If you could see my my trunk right now, Dustin, you would be appalled and maybe impressed. I don't know. It's it's impressive how much stuff I actually can fit into the back of my Toyota Corolla. Actually, on that, I actually have something. I have a sad exhibit here. If you want to see part of my motivation is uh, I this here's my golden first out right. And if I open this up, people can't see it. It I it rains a lot in Portland. Look at this. It's completely destroyed. From, That's disgusting. It's all, I know. I, I'm about to throw it away, but I had to share. But it's too bad because um, it was just, you know, that's one of the fears is like I just left the window open and, you know, lost a number of stuff. So, well, so, so, yeah. so I mean, that mobility piece is definitely a, a convenience factor, but there are hidden cost savings that I think schools don't necessarily think of. So we've had people tell us that they pay mileage um, for people to drive to central offices and pick up kits. To the extent that you always have access to your test materials, those mileage costs are no longer relevant potentially. Replacing um, stimulus books like the one you just showed us because <laughs> of the rain, um, you know, you no longer have to to do, to do that. So I think you know, not having to be carrying kits from place to place, there's a definite benefit there. And then the last one, and, and James and Kristen, you can jump in and let me know if I forgot anything. Is just the examining engagement. I think students like taking tests on the iPads and, and we knew that um, from the outset, but I think we've been surprised by how much it's mattered to people. Um, Cause that's really the strongest feedback we get is that kids love taking tests on Q interactive. And, and I think it's cool for a number of reasons. I think, um, I think there's a validity question there. So to the extent that um, kids aren't getting questions right because they're bored or disengaged is a threat to the validity of the tests. Um, I, I'll always remember at a conference, someone came up to me and said she was going to stop using the WISC on Q Interactive because her kids with ADHD were scoring too high on it. And <laughs> That's a good problem to have. Yeah, she didn't think it was clinically sensitive anymore. And I, I said, you know, I think that problem is with the, the paper version of the WISC. Yeah, it's it just a less motivating medium. That makes sense. Right. And, and you know, I think... So there's that. I think it's less exhausting for examiners. You know, so it can be tiring crawling under a table, bartering with M&Ms, whatever it is you have to do to <laughs> young kid engage with the test. So to the extent that um, technology helps with that, I, I think it makes life easier for you. And then, you know, I just think we, we've had anecdotes of people who have said, you know, Johnny's come up to me in the hallway and asked if he could come back to my office and, and play with the iPads. And that's no one's ever asked to come to my office before. So I just think there's something that, you know, it just feels good to have kids enjoy that process. It's less threatening. It's less anxiety provoking. And I was speaking to a practitioner a couple, uh, actually over the summer, where back, in, back when he was giving these tests in, in paper form, that he would have to schedule breaks during the test session, like during, during like the 90 minutes or so that he blocked out to administer this test to this kid, like every 20 minutes or so, there'd be a five minute breaks um, in the paper world. And, and now when this person gives tests on the Q interactive side of things, I mean, to Dustin's point about kind of engagement and, and the sort of excitement that people have taking the test, the guy said that not only himself, but the other people in the school district no longer need to schedule breaks when it comes to, to, to capturing this kind of data. So that, that, that energy that, that you've kind of, that, that the practitioners are getting from their, um, from their students is, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic to hear. It, you just kind of feel like people are becoming more effective and efficient with their time. So yeah, there's definitely a time savings. There's a validity piece to it. And if there's one other thing I might want to add to your original question about, you know, why might a district be interested in this? You know, the, bro- the larger the district, the more practitioners you have. And the, the varying levels of experience giving these tests, the practitioners would have as well. And so there's also turnover in a district, new people coming in and going out and so on. Q Interactive is really built around the standard administration of these tests. So your, your ceilings and your reversals, your discontinue rule, I mean, they're, they're all baked into the system. So in other words, it's really difficult to 
deviate from the standard administrative rules of these tests. Mm, yeah. So from an administrative perspective, you have the confidence that every time out the door when you're reviewing this data from a, that thousand foot perspective, that it's valid, that, that, it's, that it's according to Hoyle. So. Yeah, I was just giving an assessment yesterday, actually, and I was giving a paper protocol. And I mean, it's a mess. Like, I'm just like, in the middle, I'm like counting. I'm like, did we get four zeros? Let me go back, you know, trying to reread all of my notes. I mean, it's just, it can be, you know, there's definitely room for error. And especially with me and scoring, I just, it's not my strong suit. You know, I'm always like, you know, getting the raw score wrong and then I have to go back and it's just, it's kind of, um, it's kind of a mess. So I love the kind of um, the error proofing that the digital version has. Yeah. And I think part of that is um, that's not how you guys provide value, you know, no, definitely like, not <laughs> you can ultimately teach a high schooler probably not air free, but you could teach a high schooler to score our tests and follow administration rules. Like th those are all sort of a means to an end. Your, your real job is observing the people that you're testing and, and using those observations in conjunction with the data to sort of make insights about what's going to you know, help their outcomes. And so I think our goal with Q Interactive is really strip away some of that manual operational stuff that mm -hmm. you don't really need to be focusing on as a clinician and free you up to to do the higher level things that, you know, you're really been trained to do. Absolutely. And I also, you know, you spoke to a really important point, which was, I really want to focus my energy on observing, you know, if the child is not getting, you know, this, this item correct, is it because they saw something from across the room that distracted them? You know, what's going on? And I think that when you take less of the operations out of it, um, you're able to focus your energy on the clinical judgment and the clinical, you know, practice that you, you're, you're trained to do. That's what we're experts in. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm, I, yeah, well, I, one question I ask just anecdotally in assessment sometimes when I see that happen is I've asked students to point to the direction where the, that thought came from. And it's really illuminating. You know, actually specifically identify whatever the distraction was. Um, so, I, I mean, I think part of the overall theme here and certainly something that we talk about is like the changes within education as a result of like the ubiquity of tablets, for example, and that, and that sort of thing, you know, the facts that the districts have one on one to one ratios and these sorts of things. How does that, um, I don't, I mean, I guess even in a broad sense, like, what do you think that looks like moving forward? Like, what do you guys have coming? And it's interesting. I think of all of the, uh, of all of the different types of professionals who use Q interactive, I think SLPs, they're probably most equipped to make the switch in terms of already having technology. So when you talk about trends in, you know, tablet ownership and, and stuff like this, this is all anecdotal, but I get the sense that SLPs are more likely to have access to um, tablets because you're using it a lot already for intervention, more so than like a school psychologist or, or someone like that. Mm -hmm. so, so in that regard, I mean, it seems as though, um, more and more people are moving towards having at least one. Now, most people that we, you know, most potential users of Q Interactive that we meet don't have two iPads. So there's always that need for, get a, for getting the second one, or else we see things like um, Chromebooks or other types of tablets, um, Android or Windows-based, things like that, that, that right now we don't support on Q Interactive because it's iPad only. Uh, so those are, trends that we continue to monitor and you know as those things change we're equipped to to adapt and, and sort of meet those market needs um, we started with ipads because back when q interactive launched they were sort of the by far the predominant tablet device out there um, and there were also sizing issues so a lot of the android devices at the time were were really small and as part of our whole equivalence need we wanted to make sure that we had um, an examinee device that was big enough to display the images at a size pretty similar to what, or exact to what people are seeing in paper. So some of the smaller Androids just weren't really feasible for that. Um, that stuff is all changing and it's continuing to change, but um, bec because of the, the amount of effort we put in supporting the, the tests from a standardization perspective, we need to be very careful as these as we monitor these trends and adapt to them. Um, like we couldn't just throw Q Interactive on a tiny little screen. 
or we couldn't just all of a sudden throw Q Interactive on um, a Chromebook laptop because all of a sudden we know more people are, are using those because there are issues around administration, rapport building, standardization, and equivalence that we have to make sure we address uh, before we do that. So it's something that we're continually doing, um, monitoring all that stuff. And I'm sure in the future we'll see us um, move to different things besides just the iPads. One, other, one thing I might, I might want to throw into that too, Dustin, is um, when we think about say Android versus Apple tablets and just sort of in a mono a mono fight, uh, the Apple iPads have a shelf life that is significantly longer than your typical Android device. Um, you know, on the order of say five, six years, an, an iPad would be a, a viable tool that Apple will continue you know, to support. But that isn't necessarily always the case with Android based tablets. So, you know, when it comes to making an investment in technology, you want to make sure that it's something that is going to, it's, it's going to last it, it for a duration. Uh, and obviously things move very fast in technology, but, but Apple devices tend to have a pretty good um, longevity uh, in, in a sense. And so, yeah, you're paying a premium for the device, even though that has changed too. I mean, I, I remember you know, four years ago, uh, iPads were, 600 bucks you know, uh, on, on that order. Now you can get an iPad for 320, 330. I mean, it, so, so they, not only do they last a long time, but they've really come down in, in cost as well. So um, yeah. The other thing that I wanted to ask you guys is, you know, you, there was just an update with the Goldman Fristo. There was just an update with the self. Um, how does Q Interactive handle those updates? So one of the great things about moving digitally is you just get that new test for free as part and of And that's your amazing. <laughs> so there's no more upfront like big kit purchases um, when a new test releases. So, um, so right now on Q Interactive, for example, we have the Cell 5, the Goldman Fristo 3, and then the PT4. Um, at the end of 2018, we're expecting to release the PPBT5 and the EBT3 on Q Interactive. And so if you have our speech license um, that already contains the PPBT4, the day the PPBT5 releases, it's just going to show up in your account and you can use it at minutes. There's nothing more that you need to do. Um, there's no action required. There's no additional charge to, to get it. Um, so I think there's definitely a convenience factor there. And I think it's, um, it's also really nice for people who are starting private practices, whether it be a full-time thing or they want to do it on the side. Um, you know, you, you, have to, um, you have to spend all this money in the outset when you have a private practice on all of your test kits and all of those materials um, if you do it in the paper world. And with Q Interactive, you really kind of buy your speech license for less than – 200 bucks and um, you can elect to get billed as you use the subtest. So you don't even incur a subtest charge until you're already um, sort of seeing people and generating revenue that you can use to, to pay for those testing materials. So I think it really reduces the burden of trying to go out on your own. And I think that's true for people at the um, beginning of their career. And we've heard it from people at the tail end of their career. Like, oh, I'm going to practice for another two years. I really don't want to spend all the money on a new um, cell five kit. So why don't I just get Q Interactive, you know, for two years and, you know, I'll just finish my career using this. Yeah. Right. It's like pay as you go almost. That's, I, that was, I think, most certainly the biggest um, upfront expense starting my private practice was, was the assessments. And then I leave the window of my car open and, you know, things like that. So. Yeah. Or then there's a, there's a new version and it's like, cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think especially like in Oregon here where we have a lot of small districts, um, you know, that really makes a difference too. You know, I mean, they mainly have an SLP or half an SLP. Um, Just for the record, if you leave your car doors open with your Q Interactive iPads in them. Also it's, bad. It's not gonna, yeah, it's also bad. It's not gonna <laughs> end well for you either. <laughs> Very true. Um, well, so we, I guess we spoke a little bit to the stuff that's coming up next. Um, you know, I, I wanna honor your time and, and thank you guys very much for coming on here. Um, do we have any sort of final thoughts or questions? I'll end, with, I'll end with a very cute story that one of the research directors told me yesterday. So they were testing, I have two research directors. One was testing with self preschool and paper. 
because we're beginning the development process on that test. And I, I have another one that's working on the new bracket. And they were testing the same kids at the same daycare. And the individual that was testing with paper said that the kids started to kind of revolt against her because they all wanted to go with the gentleman that was testing with Q Interactive. Of course. <laughs> so they just kept pointing to him and saying, I wanna, I'd rather go with him. Well, right. Well, these kids are digital kids, right? They, you know, are in front of tablets from, you know, a very young age and it's just, it's highly motivating for them. So I'm not surprised by that. And yeah. kind of broadly speaking, I can, it's kind of important that I think our assessment tools kind of grow in parallel with that. Absolutely. Um, you know, iPads have been around for, oh, what, around 10 years, give or take. And um, the youth of today in particular, much less adults as well. I mean, these are devices that are integrated into our daily lives. Um, our assessment tools should, should mirror a lot of, of, uh, of, of how people live, really. So we're just yeah. kind of riding that. Yeah, that's great. Well, and using the, the motivating thing, I mean, that's, that reduces, like, I guess what we'd call attention theft and these other things, you know, they're not, they're so, they're into using the device. And like you say, too, like, I mean, that's, Rachel and I both work with um, students who very often use augmentative communication or things like that. And I can't tell you how many, um, you know, like six-year-olds I've worked with that maybe don't have oral language, but they can unlock an iPad and get into everything a heck of a lot faster than I can. So that's great. I can wait. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you so very much for coming on, Dustin, Kristen, and James. Um, again, this is uh, Lucas and Rachel with Talking With Tech, and um, we'll have some more information about, about Pearson um, after the break, and then uh, also stuff up on our website. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome back to Talking With Tech. Uh, thanks so much to the team at Pearson for coming by to talk with us today. I mean, I, I think it's really interesting not only to hear about obviously what they're doing, but um, also just to talk about the use of technology in schools. Like, it's totally changed, right? It absolutely has, and it's so interesting. You know, there's just, when it comes to technology, there's always early adopters, and I would consider myself to be one of those people who it's like, there's a new app, and I'm all over it. And then there's people, you know, who are just kind of resistant. They're just like, nah, I'm good. Like, keep it, keep it simple, keep it traditional. So it was interesting conversation to think about. Yeah, it was great. I mean, when, when I was, you know, at school age, I mean, it was basically the Oregon Trail was our was our main educational mechanism on the schools. <laughs> and you know, what's funny is I actually they just they've made a, a remake of that, and I just downloaded it um, for my phone <gasps> recently. So it's like nostalgia experience. What what is oh this a interesting question that um, you know maybe we should be asking everybody is what what's the last app that you downloaded? That is a great question. Um, so I actually just downloaded an app called Ernie. Have you heard of this app? No. Uh. Um, so it's really interesting. And to be quite honest, I don't exactly know how it works. Um, but essentially what it does is it integrates your, all of your purchases. So you put in your email and it, it can scroll through all of your emails and figure out what online purchases you've made. And if you have paid, uh, more than the, the, the cheapest price essentially online, it will notify you and then somehow it gives you money back. So wow. I, the only reason I downloaded this is because I had a friend of mine who was raving about it. I thought she was like, you know, getting kickbacks from Ernie because she was like selling me hard. Yeah, I was going to say, and listeners, we're not being paid by Ernie. No, we're Sounds absolutely not. <laughs> she, she said that she's, she's already earned $150 for wow. literally for just downloading me the free app and like inputting the information that she needed to input, which I believe is just her email. And she's getting tons of money back. I'm like, right, okay, send that out. free money. That's, that, was, that was a very adult answer. That's, that's, the answer that I have is much worse. I, I, I play the <laughs> game. So the most recent one I downloaded is this, uh, there's a trivia app called HQ, which um, frankly, if anyone's listening from HQ, it's super cheesy. It's real cheesy. They have like a video host. <laughs> On and like ask questions but I have I've got a real trivia problem that's like my main uh you know part-time addiction so um yeah I have a real trivia I have a real trivia problem too I'm terrible at trivia <laughs> yeah, that's my problem I, I to me I'm shocked by like they'll ask some random question about like you know 1970s football and I'm like I I, I know that but I don't even watch football like what how did that happen I, I can do that but I yeah. can't figure out where I left my keys every day so well <laughs> 
Thanks once again to Pearson. We really appreciate you coming on. Um, if anyone uh, wants to get a hold of us to ask any more questions, I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, you can contact us at tech dot speech or tech at speech science.org or go to tech dot speech science.org and you know we have a big old button there where you can contact us as well as more information um and thanks as always to uh to rachel we're uh, having a good time having these conversations